given station. Uh, there's multiple ways that one can measure that. One of the most common is the Shannon Diversity Index. Interesting to see that, that uh, our diversity profile shows a similar trend to the organic deposition that we've been seeing. That is high diversity near the surface uh, and down core where we have a longer history of deposition. And to remind you, this is our extractable DNA, the only biomass proxy that we got from our own data. What it suggests is a correlation between diversity and total organic input and energy input. There's a long-standing hypothesis on alpha diversity being driven by energy, the, the diversity energy hypothesis. So this data set actually seems to be a, a point in support of that idea that high, high uh, carbon input and high energy input supports a more diverse community. Looking at beta diversity, beta diversity compares different community members, so, or different uh, samples, one sample versus another. And what we look at is the abundance of different members within those communities, uh, but the metric that we used also looks at the phylogenetic distances between those, something called the unifrac measurement. So this is an ordination plot showing a principal coordinate analysis, <clears throat> and this is the first two principal coordinates, one and two, at the top, and we've uh, added sediment depth in this direction. The data points, if they're close together, it means that the microbial communities are very similar to each other. The farther apart means that they're, they're more different. And they're color-coded, again, by station. Now, this is a very busy plot. It's hard to interpret. So rather than looking at just these data, we can plot the mean. So at each depth, we can plot the mean uh, composition for each station and then look at that trajectory down core. And if we do that, we get this as a result. So red indicates station one. So we see a relatively uniform composition, it says, going from uh, near surface to down core. Stations two and three, I'll point out, uh, and you'll remember those are the stations with high nitrate and depleted ammonium. We have very similar community profiles throughout the core, top to bottom, and some more variation in station four and even more in station five. So we'll come back to that when we look at the actual members that comprise these communities. I'll just mention that uh, when you do these ordination techniques, the axes themselves often have little, if any, physical meaning. So uh, in order to help try and interpret that, you can at least look at correlations between each of those axes parameters and the measured parameters in the field to try and understand what's driving that difference in beta diversity. So yes, Wait, yeah. Sorry, um, the sedimentation rate at these sites, is it expected to be the same or does that like Great question. We, that is data we don't have yet, but it's something that we are getting. Uh, so, and, and yes. <laughs> Gene, Gene can't. I sent it to Magumi. He's, oh, good. Four months ago. We've got it, and I'll get it from Gene yeah. and then Magumi. So. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. You are absolutely critical for how we interpret these. Exactly. Right. So I'm, it's a very good question, and, and how we compare, how we even think about the dynamics of these communities is really dependent on how long they've been in place. So, yeah, thanks. So, uh, at least to get an idea of what those environmental parameters are. are uh, sometimes metadata drivers are that correlate best with beta diversity. You can look at these correlations with each of our principal coordinates. And we find that 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 correlates most strongly with our first coordinate is ammonium concentration. Uh, for the second coordinate, we find sediment depth is the strongest correlator, which is unfortunate. Uh, that's kind of a blunt instrument that, that blankets lots of different parameters. Uh, but nevertheless, it was the strongest correlation. Phaeo pigments and, and oxygen concentration, it's not surprising that those would be important. And with our third principal coordinate, the strongest correlation, a very good is one, is with pH, so, which has been observed in many environments, pH as being a, a master variable driving community composition. So <clears throat> another way to look at this, then, is the actual composition in an average core. So what I'm, what I'm presenting here at the phylum level, but one of the highest taxonomic levels, what is the composition top to bottom averaged over all seven or nine cores, whichever we had at the particular station we're looking at? So this is at the phylum level, station one, uh, and we see, I'm just going to point out the dominant players, and what you see are proteobacteria, are the dominant uh, community members, and that's not surprising. This is a common feature of marine sediments uh, in many locations. But when we move to station two, we see the emergence of another important group, and that is this bump up in Crenarchaeota. Station three, which you remember from our beta diversity, suggested a very similar community composition to station two. Indeed, we see that, certainly here at the phylum level. Uh, also, this dominance of Crenarchaeota. And by the time we go to stations four and five, we see a new group show up, and that is, whoops, there we go, the planktomycetes. 
become another important phylum of bacteria uh, become important here, and they're also important at station five. So uh, a messier but important way to also look at these communities is to look at the most abundant uh, operational taxonomic groups. So these are those microbes that are uh, most frequently encountered and account for the highest fraction of total DNA that we uh, observed at each station. Oh, I'm sorry, just to point out for those who are interested, the breakdown on the proteobacteria uh, across this transect is that they're dominated by gamma proteos followed by delta and alphas. Again, that's a pretty common proportion observed in lots of marine sediment systems. Oops, okay. So if we take a look at the 100 most abundant taxonomic groups, um, uh, it's a mess, right? So, <laughs> so that's, this is a, the definition of a, of a busy slide. Uh, but what I'm going to do is point out um, uh, within this those groups that contribute to those shifts in phyla that we saw on the prior slide. So stations two and three, you recall, we saw this bump up in Crenarchaeota. And within the Crens, uh, there are two groups here represented. Uh, the Thalmarchaeota, which is a phylum within uh, the, the um, archaea that are associated with aerobic oxidation. And stations two and three, you'll recall, are those locations where we saw deep penetrating nitrate values and depletion of ammonium down core. At the surface, as you approach the surface of these same two stations, we find an, within the Thalmarchaeota, again, uh, another group identified at the genus level, this time Nitrosopumulus. Nitrosopumulus is the only uh, Thalmarchaeota, or one of the few Thalmarchaeota that we've been able to culture uh, in the laboratory, and these are definitely ammonia, uh, aerobic ammonia oxidizers. So a nice correlation with the nitrification that we see at stations two and three. Going to stations four and five, where we saw the planktomycete uh, increase, the major contribution to that bump up comes from one candidate genus, and that is the candidate genus Scalindua. And this is uh, the, the organism that's responsible for anaerobic ammonia oxidation. So we think, uh, if we in total re recall the distribution of nitrate chemistry, nitrate versus ammonia, high nitrate uh, going down core at stations uh, two and three, and depletion, and then higher ammonia at station five, and we compare that with the distribution of these, these three taxa, we see a nice correlation there. We see this uh, nitrous epumulus, uh, most abundant near the surface. And when I pointed out the nitrite concentrations, you recall that that was highest at stations two, three, and four. So uh, assuming that nitrite is a short-lived intermediate, it, is, it, it argues that we have active nitrification in those, in those shallow sediments where we see the nitrous epumulus accumulate. And then down core, this second group of thalmarchaeota, uh, that can maybe, at least in this case, we think the data argues for their role uh, in this deep core uh, nitrification. And then moving to stations four and five, the emergence of these scalindua that are nearly absent at stations one, two, and three. Uh, so taking this collectively, we take a look at nitrogen cycling across the transect. Uh, the interpretation we have then, uh, uh, comparing these two pathways, for either aerobic or anaerobic ammonia oxidation. Stations two and three, uh, we think, are sites of active uh, aerobic ammonia oxidation mediated by these thalmarchaeota assemblages. Uh, and stations four and five are dominated by anaerobic ammonia oxidation uh, and uh, primarily being driven by the scalindua group that we see emerge. Uh, <clears throat> some other things you can do uh, that when you have 700 or 600 samples and you have down core uh, 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 profiles, is we can actually look at the spatial distributions of these OTUs in ways that you can't normally do. Uh, so many studies will just take two or three samples at two or three depths or two or three locations, and you can infer uh, the community response to the local geochemical conditions, but it's really useful if you can look at gradients of abundance for comparative purposes. So for example, not that anyone can read this, you can look at the distribution of all 620 some samples in this case as a function of sediment depth. And the cool thing about this when I first saw this was the, the, the repeatable patterns that you'll see here. So either you have close association, high abundance near the sediment surface, and that's what you're seeing here is sediment surface across the bottom, which I know no one can read because I can't read it either. Uh, but I, I'm just trying to make the point of, notice the shift in patterns. 
you either have uh, a negative correlation with sediment depth, high abundance near the surface dropping, or at the other extreme, you're absent at the surface and you have increasing abundance with depth. So we can paste on top of this some faux interpretation of possible physiological explanation with those correlations. So we can think about these guys at the, at the, the top as possibly being uh, obligate aerobes and those at the bottom obligate anaerobes and then those with these intermediate distributions where you see a peak uh, in abundance at some intermediate depth, some sort of suboxic anaerobe, facultative anaerobe, possible shifts in metabolism there. So if we just look at correlations, Pearson correlations, they can be useful under some circumstances, but they also can hide a lot. So they're, they're, they're again, a kind of a blunt instrument. You could see that there'd be a strong Pearson correlation with sediment depth in this case, po- a negative correlation here, a positive correlation in that case. But with these intermediate profiles, you'd have very low correlation. Nevertheless, if we, uh, and what we might say then is, well, maybe there's a correlation with, say, nitrate uh, concentration. So what we did then next was look at Pearson correlations across all OTUs and across uh, all environmental variables. And here's another slide you can't read, but uh, the message is going to be uh, take a look at the clustering of these, of these response profiles. So what I show here in the columns across the top are all the environmental variables that we measured. So this includes things like uh, ocean uh, water depth, uh, distance from shore, uh, uh, sediment uh, depth, uh, uh, oxygen concentration, pH, nitrate, nitrite, all, of, all the parameters that we measured. Uh, and if you see a negative uh, correlation, uh, then it's a red square. And if it's a positive correlation, it's a green square. And the more red, the more negative, the more green, the more positive. And in the vertical axis, what you see here are the 100 most abundant uh, OTUs across all stations. And of course, you can't read any of that. But what we can do, based on these correlation coefficients, is cluster them. So organisms that have similar responses to each of these environmental variables in this diagram have been joined together in a a cluster uh, uh, dendogram here on the left-hand side that unfortunately isn't showing up in this this projection. But so what we did is go in and correlate these and cluster these organisms together based on their net correlations for each of these environmental variables Then we took a look at their spatial distribution. And the cool thing is that they cluster together there too. That is that all the organisms that behave similarly with respect to the environmental variables also behave similarly in terms of their spatial aggregation. As we find, for example, with sediment depth, this is the shallowest and this is the deepest. This says that all of these organisms are found in the shallowest depths. This is, uh, the first square is zero to 0.5 centimeters. The second is 0.5 to two. Uh, And then the second shows station location, stations one through five. So in reading this, you see that these are all shallow organisms, that their abundance is greatest near the surface. And if you, say, read the station locations, this says that this organism, these organisms are most uh, commonly found at station five with much less abundance at the other stations. The far right shows a total abundance for that particular OTU across all stations. So we're interested in this kind of analysis because what it does is it, clusters together groups that have similar responses to environmental parameters. This is a type of ecophysiology. How are they responding to these environmental parameters? And similar spatial uh, distribution, which suggests some type of ecological relationship. What that is, we can't say. Could be that there is a syntrophic association between them, but there are plenty of syntrophic relations or competitive, for example, relations that wouldn't lead to this kind of correlation at all. So it's difficult to interpret, but we're using it to try and put together these groups that are ecologically coherent in their response to the environmental variables. And the long-term goal is to try and interpret that, uh, to try and under, better understand how these organisms may be interacting with each other in the environment. So let me, whoop, I can say that uh, uh, in addition to looking at these smaller uh, resolution groups, you can also look at superclusters. So, for example, uh, at the grossest scale, the largest bifurcation uh, in this dendogram, which I can't show you, uh, actually clusters this large group and separates from the bottom group. The one parameter that this correlates best with is oxygen. And what you find out is that these all appear to be aerobes, and these are anaerobes. And if you look at the spatial distribution with regard to depth, that makes a lot of sense. We find all of these near the surface, and we find these distributed throughout the sediment column. When we just look at the... Yes, Gene. Because this is so complicated, 
I, I want to ask now. And Absolutely. Have, Sorry. So the lower supergroup is very spotty. And Correct. Very scattered. Whereas right. The top supergroup is more or less uniform. Yep. You're exactly right about that. Good. And, and, and the next slide hopefully will explain a little bit. No, that's all right. You're right. What I'm adding to this now is the microbial diversity that we see. So at the phylum level, uh, so the, the highest taxonomic level, how, how diverse do you see the bacterial and archaeal phyla represented in here? And what we find is that there is a, both are dominated by proteobacteria. Again, that's not a surprise. They're dominant in marine sediments. But we see greater diversity in this group, that I'm, the supergroup I'm calling the anaerobes. Why would that be? Well, there's basically one or a few ways of being an aerobe. You're using one terminal electron acceptor. But there are many ways of being an anaerobe, including being fermentative. So that's why we think you see this great distribution uh, in, in various foci. So there's niche partitioning going on with organisms using successive electron acceptors or fermentation in different substrates. And that also supports a wider diversity of microbes, and this as evidence at the phylum level. And we haven't probed into this deeper to look at the diversity at, say, the family or class level, but we expect to see the same, the same phenomenon. So. Okay, so key findings then from our work uh, in this transect. Uh, this, the co-occurrence of high nitrate, low ammonium, uh, and the abundance of these thalmarchaeota at the min transect stations argues uh, that we have active nitrification here, and we think this is being mediated by the thalmarchaeota, this uh, uh, archaea-mediated uh, aerobic oxidation of ammonia. The emergence of scalenduo at stations 4 and 5 indicate uh, a much greater abundance of these anamox uh, bacteria. Uh, and they're contributing to uh, uh, anaerobic ammonia oxidation. Both places, uh, denitrification, certainly where, where you have nitrification, denitrification under low oxygen environments also results uh, in this re removal of fixed nitrogen to the atmosphere. So both of these locations may be contributing uh, to uh, the removal of fixed nitrogen out of the system. Uh, the uh, gradients that we see in silicate phosphate, uh, phytopigments, etc., across the gradient, all are consistent with a long-term deposition of diatoms at stations four and five, but only recent deposition at station two, which is consistent with our, our uh, historic uh, path of retreat of the ice shelf. Uh, alpha diversity metrics correlate nicely with biomass proxies, as I say, uh, supports uh, the concept of the energy diversity relationship. And then finally, approximate drivers of community composition, that, are, uh, that at least by beta diversity, uh, appear to be sediment depth, ammonia concentration, pheopigment, uh, pH, and oxygen. Okay, next steps in this work are, uh, we're, we are undertaking, a, undertaking some quantitative PCR. So everything we've been looking at so far is relative abundance, uh, and then weighted abundance, relative abundance times our DNA extract. That's the only biomass proxy we had. We'd like to go back and get another quantitative assay of the distribution of specific groups. So we're in the pro process now of using quantitative PCR to amplify archaea and bacteria, so we get a total archaea and bacteria abundance across the transect, and then also some functional genes. We're interested uh, in uh, the AMO gene. This is AMOA. This is the gene involved in uh, aerobic ammonia oxidation, both among the archaea and the bacteria, and then a gene that we find only in the anamox bacteria to try and quantify abundance across the transect. Uh, we're also looking at uh, trying to construct some, uh, 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 or conduct some metagenomic analysis of some target groups, the nitrous epumulus uh, and OP9. I'll talk a little bit more about OP9 in a minute. But where we have environments in nature that are enriched in one OTU, there's an opportunity to try and, try and construct the genome of that organism. So this would be a nice contribution of an Antarctic specimen. Uh, lipid analyses are underway and continue to be under, uh, done by Megumi Shimizu. Bioturbation metrics we expect uh, to be coming in the next uh, year. This also is important in addition to the sedimentation rates to try and interpret what's happening, in the, especially in those top 10 centimeters. Uh, diversity and uh, distribution of mega and macrofauna. This is one of the real exciting things about Larissa uh, is that Craig Smith at the University of Hawaii is looking at uh, these other players across the same transect at the same stations. So we're going to have the opportunity to combine and compare our data sets. So it's a great way for us to take a look at top-down effects on the microbial community, especially those we find at the surface of the sediments across the transect. <clears throat> 
And then finally, uh, some sediment mineralogical analyses uh, underway or will be doing with Stephanie Brockfield at Montclair State, try and give us a, an idea of the difference in composition in the sediments that, as we move across uh, that transect. So what I want to do now uh, is, is talk uh, a little bit about another site in Antarctica. Uh, and this is uh, uh, a site where uh, ichiite, this general, unusual mineral ichiite is being formed. And we're interested in looking at the role of microbial communities uh, in the biogenesis of ichiite. Uh, in particular, one core sample that we collected uh, during this, this trip. And I will say that uh, all the data I'm going to show you is thanks to a half-hour uh, quick uh, coffee with Gene just before the ship left. He said, you got to stop here and get this sample. I said, okay, okay, I'll do this. So, so uh, was, the data that results from this, uh, I should all thank to Gene for me uh, going out and bothering to collect it in the first place. So ichiite uh, is uh, an interesting material. Uh, it's a quasi-stable calcium uh, carbonate uh, uh, that incorporates uh, six waters, so it's a, it's a hexahydrate. It's formed at cold temperature and high pressure, and it's unstable at atmospheric conditions and room temperature. So uh, if you happen to be lucky enough to find one of these ichiites, you don't want to do what Jameson is doing and holding it up for a camera photo for more than a few seconds. I'm sure he put it away right away, so back in the freezer. So Because uh, you leave it out for a couple of hours and it'll decompose before your very eyes uh, into calcite and water. Now, uh, ichiites of interest for a number of reasons. Um, uh, in 2006, Ross Rickaby published a paper showing that uh, during ichiite formation, it fixes pore water into the, into the ichiite crystal with a small fractionation of water and a consistent, a repeatable fractionation of, of, of water. So you take a look at the O18 sign signature. Uh, it's a possible proxy for uh, bottom water oxygen signature and possible ocean ice volume. Then also, under uh, various conditions, uh, ichiite will undergo decomposition. If the sediments move into an environment where it's no longer stable, it then undergoes decomposition, but ma maintains the same morphology. So you form these calcite uh, uh, pseudomorphs called glendonites. So these are also of particular interest to Gene as a paleoclimate indicator of conditions under which that glendonite must have formed. So one of the questions we have in the work we're doing in Antarctica uh, is what are the precise conditions that lead to the formation of ichiite? And our question uh, is really what role do the microbes play in the process? So <clears throat> it's, uh, Antarctica and the Antarctic Peninsula is a really good place to ask this question because <clears throat> there are similar uh, environments in which we find uh, ichiite and others in which we don't find it. So the question is what's different about those? So this is uh, from a publication of genes uh, in 2007, showing, showing a number of sites uh, in and around the Antarctic Peninsula where they've sampled over the years, and uh, those that they found ichiite are shown in little green dots. And you'll see they're all uh, in this region near the tip of the peninsula called the Vega Drift. Uh, and one other location where it has been found, this is one of the original reports for the Antarctic uh, by work Erwin Seuss did in the Bransfield Strait, uh, all of the other locations in yellow have been sampled, but there's no ichiite in those. So what's different about this region? So on the 2012...